I suggest to you that what we have with this book is yet another document to be added to the millions of names in Yad Vashem, to be added to the archives that are at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum and so forth in order to fit yet another part of the mosaic into a horrible history and a recognition that as part of that history there were individuals such as Ambassador Ladosh and his colleagues and others who went out of their way and took risks in order to try to save lives in what was otherwise an untenable situation that looked totally hopeless. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor for the Pilecki Institute to be tonight here in New York City and the Hebrew Union College. We're coming here with a very difficult research that has been done. We have worked on on the list that counts over 3,000 names, but the research lasted over 18 months and it was more than 10 people involved to go through many archives, uh, archives in Poland and outside Poland to actually come with a list, not with general numbers, not with ideas or pictures of passports, but with names. And this is something we realized is, is the most important, but at the same time, easily overlooked part of the Second World War history, and especially the history of, uh, of the Holocaust, when we talk not about numbers and statistics only, but we're trying to identify people, because people had their names and they had families, and that's why we can actually come together and meet here and talk about it. We have 3,000 names, but apparently at least 5,000 others are missing. We cannot find them in the archives. If they're somewhere, they're in people's histories and in family histories, and if we don't reach out to the audience, we will not learn whether there are any other names we can add to that list. That's why we cannot hold it to ourselves and we cannot simply publish it as a book and put it on a bookshelf. Thank you very much for having me, for having the Institute here. Good evening. My name is Mordechai Paldiel. I was born in Belgium. My parents were born in Poland. Well, they came to Belgium in the 1920s and 1930s. 
during the war, we fled to France. We were in various places. And then with the help of a Catholic priest, uh, we were able to uh, cross into Switzerland, where we stayed until the end of the war. I recently discovered uh, through the help of uh, Ambassador Kummer that while in Switzerland, uh, we were supported uh, by the uh, Polish uh, legation in Bern. Supported financially because we were refugees in Switzerland and we had arrived illegally and my parents uh, had a Polish passport with them. Uh, but I want to say something about my work at Yad Vashem. I, for 24 years, I worked at Yad Vashem. I was head of the department called the Department of the Righteous Among the Nations. That's a little Polish that I know. A few more words. And uh, we honored thousands and thousands of persons from all countries of Europe who risked their lives to save Jews. And prominently among them, Polish people. I was personally involved in that, in honoring uh, many Poles, and hosting many ceremonies uh, of Polish people where we all know the risks for helping Jews in Poland was much greater, a whole lot greater than in any other country that was occupied by the Germans. Now, I, uh, so I'm very much familiar with the work, with the criteria for uh, bestowing the title of Righteous Among the Nations. I worked very closely with the commission. There's a special commission that deals with that. And at the head of the commission uh, are Supreme Court judges. I worked with three of them. And so I'm very much familiar. But I quit Yad Vashem. I resigned after 24 years, uh, 12 years ago, and I came to teach here. And I also, when I was here, I helped some people submit their stories to Yad Vashem in order to have their people uh, their rescuers uh, honored. Uh, some of them were from Polish rescuers, some of them from Slovakia, and some of them from Holland. Until last year, I never heard the name Ladosh. I never heard about this story. Uh, but when I first heard about this, and I was really fascinated, unbelievable, an unbelievable story. In all of my 24 years at Yad Vashem, I never encountered a story like this. I accounted stories of people who hid Jews in their homes, uh, in their barns, on the farms, or in the schools, or in monasteries and churches, you know, all kinds of hiding places. But a story like uh, the Ladosh uh, group, uh, this is something totally new. So I began to research that, and Ambassador Kumar was uh, friendly enough to invite me uh, on my way to Israel to stop over in uh, Bern and uh, uh, to make available to me uh, through also his assistant, uh, Mr. Yedze Ruczynski, a lot of documents. Uh, these documents are Polish documents, Swiss documents, and personal testimonies. Personal eyewitness testimonies by persons who were involved in that massive rescue operation headed by the Polish uh, Ambassador Alexander Radosh, uh, by Stefan Reniewicz, and by Konstanty Rokitsky. And I discovered that Yad Vashem had uh, awarded the title of Righteous Among the Nations to uh, Rokitsky, but only to him. Only to him. And they forgot the people who were in charge of this whole operation, his superiors, which were uh, Radosh and Reniewicz. And that mystified me. Uh, it mystified me, but uh, I also, uh, uh, from my experience at Yad Vashem, I knew that sometimes uh, the commission uh, made errors in judgment based on the documentation that was on hand. And we all make errors and we all make mistakes. The only person who never makes mistakes is Mr. Putin, of course, but everyone else uh, can make mistakes. So now I'm involved in trying to get Yad Vashem to change its opinion and its resolution, and add uh, Wadosh and Rinievich to the, to the uh, honor of righteous among the nations. I want to say a few more words about this. The story in itself has no parallel among all the rescue stories for several reasons. You have a group of Polish diplomats working closely, intimately, 
with a group of Jewish rescue operators in Switzerland. Okay, Avram Zilbersheim, Rabbi Chaim Eich of Agudat Israel, Yitzhak and Recha Sternbuch, also of Agudat Israel, they represent the Vad Hatzalah in New York. And the Polish uh, legation has a Jewish person working inside the Polish legation, dealing with Jewish affairs. I have in mind Julius Kohl. There is no parallel of such a rescue operation where principal Jews and principal Poles, Polish diplomats, are working together. That's number one. Number two, they are violating the laws of Switzerland. They are doing things which are clearly illegal. And uh, Switzerland was, uh, had declared a neutrality. Switzerland was always living in fear, for the, at least for several years, that the Germans would invade. The Germans considered most Swiss as being a, a Germanic, and they should join the Reich. In spite of that, uh, the, uh, the Polish ambassador and the other persons there are involved in clearly violating Swiss laws and the following things. They are issuing false documents. Now, an ambassador issues false documents, and these false documents are mostly documents uh, from Latin American countries, principally Paraguay. And these documents are then some, uh, forwarded to mostly Polish Jews living either in Poland or in Holland and other countries. And the Polish ambassador in Bern is helping to convert Polish citizens into Paraguayan citizens without the knowledge of the Paraguayan government. Now, this is something unheard of. Now, uh, what could have happened to uh, Lados? Uh, he could have been expelled from, from Switzerland and uh, being declared a persona non grata, uh, which would have been justified by these actions, and the uh, legation could have been closed. There was already an incident in 1940 okay, by a Polish diplomat by the name of Trembitsky, who had uh, helped to some Polish uh, soldiers to escape uh, to uh, France illegally, and he had to leave, he had to leave uh, Switzerland. And uh, the Poles had to close the consulate in Geneva. So there was already precedent that the Swiss could use uh, uh, penalties against the Polish legation. Uh, so th that's one thing. Uh, the thousands of uh, passports sent uh, to Jewish people uh, in various parts of Europe. And also Polish passports were issued to people who were not Polish citizens. Uh, a man that I knew very well and was an important minister in Israel, Dr. Avraham, uh, Dr. Yosef Burg, uh, was given a Polish passport so he could get out of Switzerland uh, and go back to Palestine there. Pierre Mendes France, who had escaped from Vichy France and was living in, in, in hiding in Switzerland, and he wanted to get out in order to join De Gaulle in London, was given a Polish passport under the name of Jan Lemberg. No, Pierre Mendes France was a French citizen and nothing to do. So here he's being issued a, a false uh, passport. Uh, the, uh, this time it's a Polish passport, not a Latin American passport. So that's number one. Number two is the secret radio transmitter from the Polish legation. That's very important because the big question that all of us historians have, when did the world learn the true uh, conditions of the Holocaust? When did it come out? When did the world learn of Auschwitz? When did the world learn of Treblinka? Interestingly, one of the first dispatches uh, to reach London, and especially New York, came out from the Polish legation, from the transmitter, where news were constantly being sent to where? To the Polish consulate in New York. And from the Polish consulate in New York, it went to Jewish organizations, and Jewish organizations learned the true condition, what was actually happening to Jews in Poland, like the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto, and other things later on in Hungary and so forth. So at the same time, the United States government, the State Department, told its ambassador 
in Bern not to send any news uh, which uh, would create a panic in the United States and would create pressure on President Roosevelt to try to do something. So here, here is uh, Wadosh and himself. Some of these messages bear his signature. Uh, this is also in violation of strict neut uh, uh, neutrality laws. Uh, and these messages go out, and uh, these messages had an impact later on to create uh, the War Refugee Board. That's number two. Number three, uh, one of the documents that were made uh, available to me is a confrontation between Ambassador Wadosh and the Swiss Foreign Minister, Pilet Lagosh. Where Pilet Lagosh tells Wadosh, what you're doing is totally illegal, and we're not gonna sit by and uh, allow this to continue. And then Wadosh gives a report, a memorandum of what happened during that conversation. Uh, not Wadosh, Pile Lagos, I'm sorry. And he writes that Wadosh was infuriated and was screaming at the Swiss foreign minister and telling him that we will continue to do that because it's a humanitarian act. You can imagine a thing like that, that uh, Pile Lagos could have, at that point, could have told Wadosh to get out of the country. Uh, but he didn't do it, okay? But then uh, the documents that was ma were made available to me showed that the Swiss were considering punitive measures against Wadosh, against Renievich, against uh, Rokitsky, and against uh, Julius Kuhl and uh, the other Jewish uh, operators there. The question is, why didn't they do it? Well, my, my uh, interpretation is by the time the Swiss wanted to take uh, punitive measures, that was already uh, towards the latter part of 1943. That was after the Stalingrad battle. The Germans had been evicted from North Africa. Mussolini had fallen. And the Swiss realized that uh, the Germans would not win the war and the Allies would win the war. And so their neutrality was uh, this time bending more towards the Allies. So uh, we have a, a massive rescue operation which uh, Ambassador Kumash would later on talk about the, uh, the, the research that he did uh, involving thousands and thousands of names. We have the many P Jewish people survived, not all of them, okay? It's, it's very intricate, it's very complicated. It involves people in the Hotel Polsky affair and so forth. And we have the threat that these people could be punished. They could be fired by the, uh, by the Swiss. There's also uh, an, an interesting document by Bruno to Eichmann about this thing, and the Germans were aware of that. It meets all the conditions that I know. Working at Yad Vashem for 24 years, for a man like uh, Alexander Yadosh and Stefan Rinievich also to be awarded a righteous title. And this has not been done, and I am very much now passionate about this in, in correcting this error and in trying to convince Yad Vashem to award the righteous title to, to these two additional heroes. And I think we Jews and non-Jews, this is uh, one example where we, we can take pride. And uh, as Jews, we can take pride that uh, four principal Jewish rescue operators were working hand in hand intimately with three Polish diplomats in Bern over a long period in the attempt to save as many Jews as possible using whatever legal and illegal methods uh, that, uh, that they could employ. So this is a beautiful story. It's very significant. We should be proud of that there were people like that. And I want to end by saying, I say to people, it doesn't matter what you think about Poland. There's a big debate about Polish behavior during the war, before the war, after the war. Okay, that's fine. We're talking about doing justice to certain people, to Wadosh and to Rinievich. They unquestionably deserve to be praised and honored and acknowledged. There's no question about it. And then leave the, all the discussion about Poland for some other proper occasion. That's my position. I want to thank you for listening to me. And uh, whom should I invite now to speak? 
uh, I want to invite, I, again, um, Ambassador, <laughs> thank you. And I'm going to take my seat. Uh, Ambassador Kumarsh, I met him, I didn't know him before last year, and uh, I really regard him very highly because he too uh, is devoting so much time to correct this injustice that was done to Wadash and Rinievich, and he has published this very important study and has collected, I don't know how he did it, these thousands of names to collect, these thousands of names of people uh, who benefited from the help of the Polish legation. Of course, these people didn't know the name of Wadosh. They got a passport, but they didn't know uh, who ordered that passport and who was involved in that. They could not have known. So I invite now my colleague, my friend, the ambassador in Switzerland, who I know soon will be an ambassador in another country in Turkey. Ambassador Jakob Kumach, please come up to the restroom. Well. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, first of all, dear Holocaust survivors, uh, I'm in a quite difficult position because uh, I don't know what to say, whether I can tell anything more. Dr. Palier, you have really, your intervention was quite extensive and you have said mostly what I wanted to say. My other problem is that recently I spoke uh, in London at a winner Holocaust Library, and I realized during my speech that I'm speaking mostly to people who came from Holland and Germany. So I had to explain them everything, including the origins and why Poland had an embassy in Switzerland. Now, as far as I can see, I'm speaking to Polish people. Is there anybody who is not Polish here? Okay. Okay, so, 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 you, so your ancestors came from other parts of the world. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, ambassador of Poland. I've been ambassador of Poland to Switzerland since 2016. But before in my previous life, I was a scientist and I did mostly um, quantitative researches into very different, different subjects. I'm not a historian, which may have helped in discovering this story paradoxically. Uh, I'm also a former journalist and journalists have the propensity to feel a subject. When a subject is really interesting, they understand that this is, this is something I should write about and I should keep, stick to it. Uh, in 2016, when I came to Switzerland, I had never heard the name Alexander Wadoš. So, Dr. Palier, you're not the only person who hadn't he he heard about Alexander Wadoš. This story is a Jewish legend from Switzerland. I mean, Jewish Orthodox legend kept in some very few families namely the Sternbuch family, which was involved in the operation, in some Orthodox families from Zurich, from Geneva, and so on, and so on. I was confronted with it very, very soon. As you mentioned, uh, our honorary consul, Marcus Blechner, who is the son of Holocaust survivors and grandson of Holocaust victims himself, came to me and told me, why don't you do anything about your great predecessor, Ambassador Wadosh? I didn't know what to say because I had never heard about Wadosh. He said, yes, I'm, you're the third ambassador I'm coming to with this story and no one wants to listen to me. Well, I understood that there was a, my predecessor, one of my predecessors massively fabricated some kind of passports for Jews. but. Uh, well, everybody who is familiar with the nature of the German occupation of Poland understands that this is somehow unbelievable that a piece of paper would really convince SS or Gestapo or anybody, or anybody from the German occupation authorities that this person should be spared. The Germans shot people on, on the street in Poland. It was not Holland or France or where people were deported. They were murdered sometimes in the middle of the day on the streets. And not only Jews, Warsaw is plenty, full of different places where, for example, Poles were executed in summer executions. Somebody killed a German soldier, 50 people were, were shot. That's, and that happened during the day. No one, they didn't make a big story out of it. It was, it was everyday, everyday life under the German occupation. So I didn't believe it. I said, well, Paraguayan passports, an illusion, nothing more. 
It was on the, the, May, May, the 3rd of May, 2017, several months after, when Marcus brought a guest to the embassy, an Orthodox Jewish person, really very religious man and very honest man, Moshe Rappaport, Professor Moshe Rappaport from the University of Zurich. And he told me, you know, it's the first time I'm here in the Polish embassy and I have always dreamed about it because because this is a holy place. Well, usually you don't often hear about your home that this is a holy place for somebody. So exactly the, the next day, I just, I just Googled, very simple, Googled Paraguayan passports, Alexander Wadush. And I found actually a document in, uh, about which Dr. Paldiel has already said. A conversation in 2000, 19, 1943 between Marcel Piregolas, Foreign Minister of Switzerland, and Alexander Wadosh, my predecessor. It was October 1943. Alexander Wadosh was confronted by the Swiss Foreign Minister who reproached him that Polish diplomat had been doing something very illegal, namely fabricating some documents and violating Swiss neutrality. And then all of a sudden what I said, it's not about Switzerland, it's about Poland, it's about Paraguay, it's about the lives of these brave people. Then I understood, yes, there were some past, there, there, there was something like Paraguayan passports. And my predecessor knew about it and he defended it. Now it's very important because I thought, what, what was going on? Why? Polish diplomat being confronted in such a situation, being caught on illegal activities do, done by his men, instead of saying, I mean, I don't know, I have never heard, I have no idea, what, what are you talking, what you are talking about, no, what, what kind of passports. He admits that they have done it. Now I understand what happened. Namely, if Alexander Wadej had said that the operation was not by him, it would be considered by the, it would have been considered by the Swiss as a green light. Now you can arrest everybody, you can, you can close all, you can break the ring, you can arrest people who had done it, you can uh, put the Jewish activists to prison. But instead, he chose another option. He blackmailed Swiss, the, the Swiss. He said, we are going to make a big scandal out of it. And Dr. Paldiel, when you asked me whether, why Swiss, the Swiss don't, did not intervene, well, I have lived in Switzerland for four years, and I know that the Swiss have very good propensity, bad, good, but basically this is their policy, that when there is no need to make a problem, they don't create problems. If nobody knows, if there is no German reaction, if there is no threat, there is no, no uh, reason to intervene. Uh, I didn't want, I was very much afraid, I must say, I must, I'll be pers quite personal, that if I say that as a Polish ambassador in 2017, you know, my predecessor rescued Jews, it would be considered as Polish propaganda, nothing more. So I asked well-known journalists to do their research. Mark McKinnon from the Daily Globe and Mail in Canada, I offered this story also to Washington Post, but they were not really interested. And Jenny Gazeta Prawna, which is a liberal new Polish newspaper, quite objective, not, neither pro-governmental, neither pro-opposition. The newspaper I used to work in myself until 2009. They actually, they discovered more. They discovered more. They found documents in various archives saying that there was a constant produ production of Paraguayan and other passports in the Polish embassy, that the Polish government in exile, and this is very important when we mention Poland and Jews, that the Polish government in exile, which represented Poland, which refused to capitulate in 1939, and which uh, operated from first France and then London, that the Polish government recognized the operation and supported it from the very beginning. Now we know that my predecessor, Alexander Wadoś, even received instructions from London. That's how, for example, some Jewish families were rescued. 
whether she was told by the Minister of Foreign Affairs to produce a passport to a family of Kruskal from, from, from Germany, for example. Whether she was told by the uh, Prime Minister to obtain a pa passport from an for another individual. There is a list, unfortunately, the list is not uh, to be found anymore, we, we are trying to find it, with 62 names of prominent Jewish figures who were to be rescued this way. We only know the mentions of this list. Well, you may of course ask why uh, Poles rescued Jews this way. Well, this is very simple response to it. Although uh, I will not, uh, I'm not, I'm the last one to defend uh, the, let's say every poll for the action before, during, and sometimes after the Holocaust. But the government of Poland was a government of a free nation. As much as American government protects its citizens overseas, the Polish government also believed that it's, there, it's, just, it's, it's ta task to protect the Polish, Polish citizens. And Polish diplomats did not follow any feelings or beliefs or something. They followed the law, that's all. Very shortly after the, 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 the two articles, two stories, Heidi Fishman contacted us. Heidi, who lives in Connecticut, we are going to speak tomorrow at her event. Heidi is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor from Holland. Well, actually, German family who, has, who had escaped to Holland before the, the war and they were caught there and they spent years in various concentration camps, finally being uh, liberated in Theresienstadt. Heidi Fishman saw uh, a picture of a Paraguayan passport in one of the articles and said, look, my grandfather had this kind of document and the handwriting is identical. Paraguayan passports had all identical handwriting. We didn't, I, didn't, I didn't notice that at the very beginning. This person com does not come from Poland. This is a German, uh, she's a descendant of German Jews with no particular links to Poland. This was probably the biggest discovery of this operation. We found out that the handwriting on the Paraguayan passports and the handwriting of a note left in, at the, in the embassy belongs to the same person. Very a few months later, an Israeli person contacted us and said, hey, I had a real Polish passport of my mother issued in Bern in 1941. Look at the handwriting on the Polish passport and the handwriting on the Paraguayan passport. This is the same person. The handwriting belongs to Consul Konstanty Rokitsky, whom at, from, at, from that moment we started considering one of the biggest actors in this rescue operation. Let me tell you a little bit more about these six brave people. Well, we may speak whether they were deliberate, whether there were more than six or less than six. Definitely in the whole operation, hundreds of people participated by obtaining the passports, by financing the passports. Uh, a lot of uh, British and American Jews contributed by financing the operation through the channels organized by the Polish government. Again, the, the, the Ministry of Finance organized a channel. You could, for example, pay a certain amount of money for, uh, for, for bri to, to, to bribe the, the honorary consul, uh, consuls of Latin American states. You could um, uh, deposit here at the Polish consulate in New York or in, at, the, at, at the Ministry of Finance in London. The money should be deducted from the, um, from the reserve of the Polish National Bank in Bern and used for the purpose of this operation. So there is also a credit to, um, to American and British Jews for, or for helping. Uh, for helping this, this rescue, rescue operation. Look at these people. There is Alexander Wadosh, my predecessor, ambassador, Paul, or at that time we, we called minister, uh, because um, the, embassy was called, uh, the embassy was called legation at that time. But you can have at his uh, right side, you can see Haim Israel Eyes. Haim Israel Eyes was the leader of Orthodox Agudat Israel. He was based in, in Zurich, uh, and he had really very good contacts with Orthodox Jews all over, the, all over Europe. Probably he joined uh, the operation in 1942 to rescue his, children, his child in Belgium, in Antwerp. 
uh, his daughter was married to, to a person who later on, who survived and later on became the leader of Agudat Israel in Belgium. Down you can see Abraham Zilberstein. This is probably one of the most forgotten and biggest Jewish rescue heroes of Jewish rescue, Holocaust rescue heroes. A person, both Ice and uh, Zilberstein, had a very specific task, and without them, this operation would not succeed, would not happen. Uh, well, no, none of us, I mean, Alexander Wadish probably tried to rescue, and his group tried to rescue 10,000 people, but none of us knows 10,000 people. We would not know how to whom issue the passports. So what is very important is to have the lists and it, to, to have the whole network of people who will bring to us the data, details about people to rescue. And these people must be also verified. What if we, for example, start issuing passports to, to Gestapo agents? That would be the disaster. That would put, jeopardize the life of, lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of passport owners. So uh, Abraham Zilberstein, 1943, was tasked by the Polish embassy, was asked by the Polish embassy to, to uh, cooperate, to, to be the, the only focal point for non, I mean, secular and uh, Zionist Jews, as much as Chaim Eyes worked with religious ones. Um, Abraham Zilberstein, was a man of trust. He, was a, he, was a, he had been a former deputy, member of Polish Sejm. And do, for, to those who did, do, do not come from Poland also, there is one, one remark to make. Yes, there was anti-Semitism in Poland before the war, as in every other country, as in the US. There's, I mean, we, we are all responsible for this, for this atmosphere. And yes, the Polish state, largely in the 30s, failed to protect the, the minorities, not only Jews, but Jews as well, against discriminations on the social, social level. But at the same time, the law in Poland, there, was, there had, had never, has never been any so-called Jewish law in Poland. Polish Jewish passports were not marked with the letter J, as it, as it happened in Germany. Polish Jews served in the army, served in diplomacy. They were professors at the universities. They walked down the streets. They, 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 the, the streets of the Polish cities were in at least one third, 40% Jewish. You can, you can see it on the pictures. It was much more, I mean, many Polish cities look like what you have in Brooklyn, for example. It's, it was quite normal that, 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 that the Jewish people were all, all, all around. And they also served the Polish state. You can see Julius Kühl, 26 year old, a PhD student, actually not, uh, already doctor of um, economic studies at the, at the uh, Bern, uh, University of Bern. He came from a Hasidic family from Sanok, southern Poland, and he joined the legation at the, probably in 1939 and became its expert on Jewish refugee affairs. Julius Kühl knew uh, practically every uh, influential Jew in Switzerland. He was called to know everybody from A to Z, from Aguda to Zion. Uh, now you have Konstantin Rokitsky, the forger from Bern, the, the one who made most of, uh, of the, the forging um, uh, activity. But there is nothing to, I mean, there's no reason to hide that Konstantin Rokitsky was not also only a consul. Konstantin Rokitsky was probably one of the biggest assets of Dvojka, of the Polish military intelligence. He had served in the Soviet Union. He was really very good in Soviet, Soviet, Soviet affairs. He was also a war veteran. Uh, you know, heroes are sometimes uh, heroes during their, uh, their entire lifetime. This person was also decorated for bravery. Uh, he led a, an open cavalry charge in 1920 against the Soviet positions during the War of Independence. So, so uh, 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 well, let's say, really a person who fulfills all criteria to be called a hero. And finally, Stefan Rinievich, what a second. What a, Stefan Rinievich, he was also active in, in, in pro-independence movements before 1918, and he very soon joined the foreign service, um, serving in several places, finally being deployed to Bern in 1938. Uh, Probably Stefan Rinievich was the one who found the Honorary Consul of Paraguay to buy passports. Honorary Consul of Paraguay, who was Swiss, please do not mix all these illegal activities with Latin Americans. None of the persons who sold passports for profit 
was Latin American. None. They were all very rich Swiss lawyers. They didn't need this money, you know, to, to maintain their families or I don't know what. They were very well situated people, members of the local Swiss elites. And one more thing, there was a massive corruption around all this operation. If some bad people know that there are passports to, which may save lives, they will sooner or later start using it for purpose. There was unfortunately a lawyer in Switzerland who would target Jewish banking families and offer Wadoš passports for as much as one million Swiss francs, which is let's say $10 million today. And there was a family who paid such a bribe to him. It doesn't mean that he had anything to do with the Polish diplomats. He had an intermediary to come to Polish diplomat, to, to, to Polish embassy to contact Julius Kuhl, to give him 2,000 and to say, you know, there's a family who, who needs rescue. And there is a person who still is alive, who still lives in, in Luxembourg, whose family was cheated the same way. We actually made a whole inquiry. He, they paid 170,000 Swiss francs for a Paraguayan passport, and Polish and Julius Kuhl received 2,000. The sum he absolutely 100% spent on buying the document. There is no doubt that none of these brave people had any personal profits out of this operation and particularly Konstantin Rokiski, who operated the whole bribed, bribing system and, forge, forging, for, and forgery, already in 1946, when, tri, when, when, when he became a political refugee and tried to stay in Switzerland, he was declared, at the first instance, too poor to be, to be permitted to stay. So it says something. Luckily, there, was, there were also good Swiss policemen who declared, who said that yes, we understand, but his situation is particular. And they also mentioned that it's true that he was active in illegal operation during the war, meaning forging passports, but they stressed uh, what was the difference between him and other people involved, meaning those rich lawyers, is that he did not do it for profit, but out of what kind of reasons? What do you, what do you mean? What do you, I, I would say humanitarian, but the Swiss said patriotic. That was the, that was the, 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 the way they, they understood this operation at that time. And one, one more remark. This subject is definitely not the entirety of the Polish-Jewish relations during the war. That must be clearly said. And that's why my uh, uh, ambition was to focus on facts and figures and numbers, and not on philosophy. I'm not a Holocaust philosopher, I know there are many. I'm just a person who discovered a certain, who helped discover, discover a certain fragment of reality. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So what really happened in Bern? Uh, it turns out that those six, six people uh, created a system of forging uh, Latin American passports. Uh, to show you how it worked, it's the best scheme is to show you the uh, Paraguayan passports. How was it produced? Uh, first, Polish diplomats uh, buy blank passports from the Honorary Consul of Paraguay, Rudolf Hugli. The Paraguayan embassy was uh, 300 meters from the Polish legation office. Uh, they would buy, for example, 100 uh, blank passports at a time. Uh, the Jewish organization provided all the, data, all, the, all the data, personal data of people who needed help and also uh, provided, uh, provided uh, their photos. Uh, passports, blank passports, went to, went to the Polish legation where Konstanty Rokitski handwritten all of them. Then it had to be legitimized, uh, so it had to return to the Paraguayan consulate. Rudolf Hungli certified it, uh, I mean he, <laughs> uh, he just gave it a stamp and a signature. Finally, the Jewish organization uh, distributed them to the occupied Europe. 
the passport increased only chances of surviving. Uh, instead of going to extermination camp, the Jews who had the document would be taken to internment camps. By receiving such passport, uh, such pas passport of a country which was not occupied by Germany, people were considered by Germans by for as uh, foreigners. Uh, so they were sent to internment camps uh, with the possibility for exchange uh, of Germans who were captured by Allied forces. Uh, my goal, my team's goal, was to uncover uh, as many the details of the passport uh, operation. Uh, our journey started in the place where the group operated, so in Switzerland, in Bern. The Federal Swiss Archives in Bern turned out to be the most significant sources of information. Uh, it was there that we found the testimonies um, of the, in the investigation against this honorary consul of Paraguayan. Uh, he was accused of making profit of selling blank documents and visas. Uh, three uh, members of the group testified during this investigation. One of them was Abraham Silberschein. Uh, from, the, from his and uh, Abraham Heim's Heim eyes, uh, and from those accounts, for the first time, we knew that the Polish legation was involved. Abraham Silverschein provided uh, the personal data and photographs of people who needed help. He also was responsible for the securing financial supporting for the group. Heim eyes. <laughs> That's too fast. I'm sorry. Uh, Heim Eyes organized a smuggling network. Uh, he also obtained personal data and financial resources. Then we started to uh, look for individual archives uh, of uh, individual members of the group. Uh, we started with Abraham Silberschein, the key member of the group. Uh, he gathered information about Jews who were trapped in Europe. We turn out to his personal archive, which is located in Yad Vashem, in Israel. The archives turned out to be a trove of documents from World War II, uh, with 300 archival units and uh, thousands of scanned documents. Uh, possibly the most, imp uh, the most uh, important and exciting discovery were those lists of people uh, who, to whom, uh, whom uh, Abraham Silverstein wanted to help. Uh, at first, we didn't know what his notes and abbreviations means. You, you can see them, there are P something, L something. Uh, we didn't know what does it mean. We couldn't decipher it. But only, only, it was only later that we found his own instruction. Uh, it was a key to decipher his notes. Uh, this allowed us to, to understand his system. Uh, what kind of document was prepared? Uh, what kind of passport was it? Was it a Honduran or a Paraguayan? And to whom it was sent and by who? Was it a company uh, or a person? And to what destination? Uh, we also found the correspondence between him and Konstanty Rokitsky. Uh, it confirmed that it was Konstanty Rokitsky that issued all the passports. Silverschein in those letters asks him to make some corrections in, in issued documents. So Rokitsky must have been uh, the person who had issued them at the first pl uh, place, as the handwriting has to be consistent. In uh, January 1944, uh, Abraham Silverschein wrote that he had already issued passport to 10,000 people. Um, another valuable source was the Heim Heiss collection. Uh, the most important for us uh, were the documents confirming the transfer of, ma of money to Heim Eyes through the Polish legation. Uh, we also found some photographs of people uh, to whom the passports were supposed to be issued. Unfortunately, Eyes died uh, in the middle of the whole operation in 1943. So uh, probably those people didn't rece receive such a document. Uh, then we start to look in, uh, in Poland, in Warsaw. Uh, that's the, uh, th those are the 
coded telegrams uh, who were, which were sent to Polish, like the Polish legation and from the Polish legation. Um, Alexander Wados gave uh, to the Jewish organization in Switzerland uh, access to those coded messages. Uh, thanks to that, they could contact uh, American Jewish organization. Uh, in those uh, deciphered messages, we found description of the passport operation, uh, its goal and more information con concerning the logistics and also money transferred to, uh, to Switzerland. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Wadosh uh, Group issued only those four Latin American countries' passports. That was Haiti, Honduran, Paraguayan, and Peru. Here you can see examples of Paraguayan passports. During our query, we found 216 such, para such passports. We found 75 Honduran passports. We found some of Haitian passports and also not many Peruvian passports. Uh, all identifi identified names we put into the database. Our final task uh, was to find the fate of these people. Uh, we started with a simple task. Uh, we started to look for, for searching them online, in online databases. Uh, then we started to cooperate with some institutions who have more uh, valuable uh, databases. It was Jewish Historical Institute, Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, and the, and the Institute of National Remembrance. We looked also for post-war accounts. Um, we thought at first that it would be impossible to find uh, the fate of those people because we had only, for example, place of stay of a given person. But with time, with time, we managed to establish the fate of a growing number of people. And now the numbers start, so <laughs> Jakub will tell you about them. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Maniewski. Thank you very much. We have here thousands of names. And hopefully, very soon, we will be able to find many of the descendants of these people and we will have a big reunion, a gala of hundreds, maybe thousands of children and grandchildren of these people who received the passports and uh, that will be something extraordinary. I say this because I'm also associated with the Sousa Mendes Foundation, the uh, Portuguese ambassador that gave out thousands of uh, Portuguese uh, visas, and uh, we have so far already found several hundred of uh, family members of those who uh, give out the visas. So uh, hopefully uh, the Pilevsky Institute uh, will, uh, they have so much information already, and that will be uh, the next project. The other thing I want to mention is one of the interesting documents that I came across, a Swiss document. It's uh, dated in May 7th, 19, uh, 1940. At that time, Ladosh was about to come in to become the uh, minister of the uh, Polish legation in Bern. He was, go he was replacing someone else that was leaving. When this became known to, to Germany, the foreign minister von Rippentrop called the Swiss ambassador, summoned him, and objected very much that the Swiss government was nominating, that was allowing a person to come in and occupy uh, the Polish embassy, which the Swiss had downgraded to legation in order to conciliate the Germans. Uh, Joachim von Lippertop said, the Führer has learned about this. I never saw the Führer in a greater rage than when he learned that there was going to be a Polish uh, diplomatic representative in Switzerland. After all, Poland does not exist anymore as a nation. Uh, they have no right to have a government. Uh, at that time, the Polish government was in Angers in, in France. That's before France fell. Well, uh, the uh, 
Swiss uh, ambassador reported that to his government, and that's how we have the archives, and then he was called in again. Uh, and uh, uh, Van Rippentrop told him, you all know who Van Rippentrop was, and he said, we consider the nomination of a Polish diplomat in Bern to be an unfriendly act towards Germany. No, an unfriendly act, a term like this, diplomatic term, mean, that's like, an, that's like a, uh, an invitation for war. When you say, when you accuse another country of an unfriendly act. Then uh, the uh, German ambassador was asked to see the, the president of Switzerland. And the president of Switzerland said to the ambassador, we are simply replacing one diplomat with another. And after all, he said, uh, indeed, uh, Poland uh, is occupied by uh, both Germany and the Soviet Union, uh, but even the Germans have not said what they plan to do with Poland, whether they, maybe they want to restore some kind of Polish independence. So there is uh, no harm in having uh, someone who replaced uh, uh, another Polish ambassador who left. Uh, and, uh, well, the Germans didn't take that uh, very kindly, but at that very moment, uh, the Germans were involved in the operation of uh, Norway. They were invading Norway, and there was a Polish uh, regiment that was fighting on the side of the Allies, so Poland was still at war with Germany, so to speak. And then later on, uh, uh, the mo a month later, in May, came the German invasion of uh, Belgium, Holland, and uh, France, stunning victory, and uh, the Germans forgot a little bit about uh, this Ambassador Ladosh, who in the meantime came to uh, Bern and uh, occupied uh, the position of minister. But it just goes to show you that uh, uh, the sensitivity of, this, uh, of uh, the Polish uh, legation in Bern in the eyes of the Germans that they were aware that they didn't like this idea. And, uh, and I'm sure that Wadosh also was aware of this thing. He probably was told about this. He probably must have been told by, by the Swiss uh, authorities to be very careful about his behavior. So uh, that, that uh, contrast with uh, the story that you just heard uh, about uh, the, the acts uh, of rescue by uh, Wadosh and the, the other two ambassadors, which is extraordinary by all dimensions. And again, I want to finish and say, this is all certified by evidence and documents. There's a document by Abraham Zilbersheim, which has been stored at the Yad Vashem for, for 50 years. And it's there, and it's very clear. It's wide, and he talks about the, the, the Polish diplomats who worked with him. In fact, they invited him to come and uh, be involved in this operation. Now, uh, Ambassador Kumov would like to uh, say a few more words, would like to explain more about uh, this uh, Ladosh operation. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, yes, the Germans did not like Alexander Wadosh, and Alec they had reason to dislike him. Alexander Wadosh had been Consul General to Munich, 1927-1931, and he knew the Nazis. He met Enström, who was organizing his meeting with Adolf Hitler when Wadosz was revoked to Poland in 1931. It's also confirmed by historians. Uh, Alexander Wadosz did not like the Nazis. He hated this, this movement. He was a deep Democrat and deep anti-Nazi, and he knew what the Nazi Germans were ready to do. So he had no illusions about the nature of of what was going on in Poland. Also, in 1942, a Polish courier, Napoleon Segiera, brought the Pilecki report from the occupied Poland when he mentioned the existence of the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp. And this report came, Wadish was one of the first people who saw this report. So he had no doubt what was going on in the German occupied Poland. But uh, without being too emotional about my predecessor, let me just uh, conclude with the data we have gathered. First of all, uh, we started with Jędrzej Uszynski, uh, being still uh, my, my, my colleague, my, one of my diplomats, to gather the names of the 
people who had Wadosh, what we call Wadosh passports. It was the idea by Darius Stola, then the, the director of Pauline Museum in Warsaw. He just told me, you know, you have to do something. If you have these passports, you should try to find out what happened with these people. And I was really afraid because I believed, and many historians at that time believed, that the operation was largely unsuccessful and that these people died, that we are going to only to fi find people who were given an illusion and they did not make it. So we started from collecting various lists of uh, uh, owners of Latin American passports being in concentration camps in 1944 and 1945 and having registered with the Nazi authorities the fact that they were in possession of such nationalities. Uh, such lists can be found, for example, in the United States Holocaust Museum, like uh, the list of 646 owners of um, Latin American passports imprisoned in Bergen-Belsen in uh, January, in February 1945. But there are also other lists. And finally, we, thanks to our colleagues from, from uh, Pilecki Institute who joined us and who did a big part of this uh, archivistic um, job, we uh, found also um, uh, individual passports. So we entered every single name we found onto the list. We googled the name first, the names first, finding a lot of databases, for example in Holland there is a Yotz monument, a very big database of, of Dutch Jews, but also in Yad Vashem, also in some other, Genicom was very, very, very helpful. And finally, all this list was verified in, inter in an international tracking system, in, uh, Bad Aral Sands, which is the biggest database of Holocaust victims and survivors. Uh, we also checked the database of uh, the uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Museum, um, which helped us identify se several victims and several survivors. This is the number we this is a certain, we, we, we assume, were the passport owners. Why, how we achieved this number? May I ask you a question? Yeah. Does this number include those who did not receive uh, passports, yes. but they received promessa? Yes, yes. In other words, yes. they received like citizenship yes. papers, yes. but not passport because yes. they didn't have the pictures of these people and yes. all the information. Yes. That is included yes. in that number. Yes, when we Thank call, what, what, what we call Wadosh passports is de facto passports and promises or uh, confirmation of citizenship of four countries. We don't claim any other country. For example, I, we have never said, we, we, we are very strict to say these passports were created with, uh, uh, by what we call Wadosh Group and some other Latin American passports were created by other people. We don't say that all the Latin American passports which were in use were, were created by these, these six um, people, although I personally believe, and I, I'm, it's not the belief, uh, all the documentation I have seen suggests that the vast majority of Latin American papers were created, which were in possession of the Jews in Europe, in the Nazi-occupied Europe, were created in Bern by, with direct or indirect participation of Polish diplomats. So how we achieve this number? It's very simple. When you see uh, the Paraguayan passports, they have um, serial numbers. Serial numbers are growing. We have seen it many times that, for example, if a family, extended family, receives four passports, they will be given cons consecutive numbers. 301, 302, 303. So we have identified four different series of Paraguayan passports and taking the biggest number found, it was respectively 570 and 342 plus a uh, few uh, unnumbered passports, we have summed it, summed it up and received 1,000, more than 1,000 passports. Then using the uh, found passports, these random samples, we have counted how many people are on all, the, all these passports. And it's statistically 2.34 people per passport. So this led us to believe that Konstanty Rokitsky and uh, one forger more, whose identity is still unknown, but it was just a very tiny minority of the documents, have or has or have created uh, passports for 2,350 people. Now, Honduran passports are also, also numbered from the highest number found is 751, and the average of the people on one passport is 2.02, .02, meaning 
150 people, 1,500 people, sorry. Now, when we, uh, uh, the other documents are not numbered, so theoretically we should not know their number, but um, if we take the big database left by Abraham Zilberstein and treat it as a random sample, then we can count the percentage of different types of documents, which, is, which, which figure on this list. So having done that, we have received these numbers, that, that the number of, of the, the real number of uh, passport owners should be between uh, 9,100 and 11,700. But I believe that scientists should be really careful when speaking about numbers. It's better not to exaggerate, because then you stop being scientists and you start being, uh, uh, I mean, you start, start mixing science and propaganda. There are reasons. Uh, for which I believe that, for example, the number of Peruvian documents in um, um, uh, Zilberstein papers were, was overestimated, because the Peruvian consul acted very sh for a very short time. And uh, finally, uh, Abraham Zilberstein also testified that he managed to produce only uh, several dozen passports. So we reduced this number to eight to 10,000 to be sure that this is something we can take responsibility for. Um, also, this 10,000, the number 10,000 corresponds with the, the, with the testimony, sorry, testimony which Abraham Zilberstein at one moment uh, gave during his interrogation when he was arrested, briefly arrested in uh, September 1943. Now, we have found that we have identified 3,253 people so far. So the minority of passport owners, minority, between 30 and 40 percent. We are still looking for five to seven thousand names. Uh, these names are not in the archives. These names can be found only if we really speak about them, did and we find the passports, remaining passports in Jewish homes. This is the only way we can know the names of other survivors and victims. Now the statistics. We have identified 834 documented survivors, people who were, supposed, were or were supposed to be in possession of Wadosh passports. 834. 834 who survived thanks yes. to this passport. Well, I wouldn't say who survived thanks to this passport. I, I would say who survived being in possession of this passport. Some of them, for some of them, their rescue was irrelevant. I mean, the, 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 the possession of the passports was irrelevant. I mean, they rescued in hiding, for example, without even knowing that they, they, they had passports. There is a huge scope of influence the passports had. From the very direct one, as Lord Finkelstein recently said, a very famous British journalist, that her, his mother survived because she was in possession of, of one of Wadish passports. But there is also a case of, for example, Adam Rothfeld, our foreign former foreign minister, uh, who was a for, foreign minister of Poland in 2005, and who is a child Holocaust survivor. Uh, it was me who told him that his father and he are on the list, were on the list too. It was very important to him to know that somebody tried to rescue his father, but his father did not survive, and he himself went, was hidden by Ukrainian monks. So, uh, so there is no impact in this case. But uh, from our perspective, it's irrelevant, because Alexander Wadish had no impact at all at what, to what the Germans are, how the Germans are going to react. This is like a, a Polish journalist compared it to somebody um, throwing rescue, rescue wheels. And whether people will catch them, whether they will, they will, they will help them on the sea, it's, it's not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't belong to the person. May I say something here, that uh, some of the people that were aided, it's, it's not only to save them from the Germans, but I hope we have no representative from the Soviet embassy here, but also from the yeah, Russians. Yes, yes, yes. That's, because that's... in the Russian occupied zone of Poland, up until the German invasion of Russia, yeah, all right, uh, they were persecuting a lot of Polish people and sending them and to Jews Siberia. Too. And so some of these uh, Latin American passports were sent to Jews who were in Lvov and other places to make it possible for them to leave the Soviet Union go to Japan. When they came to Japan with a 
Latin American passport, they met the Polish representative there, I believe his name was Romer, and uh, they got then a Polish passport, um, thanks to, and with which they could continue to other destinations. So people were rescued also uh, from not being harmed by the Soviet authorities at the time when they were harming a lot of Poles uh, who were in the Soviet Union. And, and now, comes the, uh, now, now comes the question, the very, very question which will always be raised by many historians, all those who like the story and those who don't like the story, because there are also people like that. The, um, look uh, at the statistics. This is the three biggest countries, uh, uh, basically the, 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 the three, three countries where the passport owners came from, Poland, Netherlands, and Germany. This make 94% of all people identified on the list. They are citizens of Poland, Netherlands, or Germany. Poles represent 70%, Germans and Dutch 24% total of um, the passport owners. But look at the statistics, what happens. Poles prevail, Polish Jews. But only among the passport owners, not among the survivors. Well, I must admit that in Poland, in German-occupied Poland, having a Wadish passport theoretically increased the possibility of survival. It was as high as 15%, much higher than the possibility of the Polish Jews to survive the German occupation. But much higher, because if 15% of Polish Jews were rescued, then Poland would have ended the war, the, the war having, having had half a million strong Jewish population, and it did not happen. We, know, we all know that. Most of Jews who lived in Poland after the war were those who survived in the Soviet Union. And only, well, no one knows how many survived in hiding. So the statistics seems to be bigger, but most of Polish Jews did not survive or look at the third number, the fate is unknown. This is, this is the most terrible discovery of this study, that whenever I met a Polish Jewish uh, passport owners, I knew that after that Googling doesn't, will not give any results. The person lived in 1939 and disappeared, not perished, disappeared by 1945. It doesn't mean that all of these 1,000, 1, I can't see, 103,000, 25, right, people, that all of them are dead. There are survivors among them too. Some of them made Aliyah after the war, some of them escaped from Poland. There was a huge, massive escape of, of Jews after the war. People, the communities were, had been wiped out. No one wanted to live in a communist paradise and so on and so on. I just want to add that the reason that many of these people did not survive, for that we have to thank the Spanish ambassador in Berlin. The Spanish ambassador in Berlin who represented Paraguay and represented these countries because they had no diplomatic relations, alerted the Germans that these passports were fake passports. The Germans were hoping with these passports to exchange them from, for German nationals living in Paraguay and the other countries. So the Spanish said, be careful, these, these are fake passports. And by the time, by the time Paraguay and Honduras and this uh, asserted that they would honor these passports, Many of these people were taken out from Vitel, from Bergen-Belsen, and sent to Auschwitz, and they died. And for this, the blame is the Spanish ambassador in Berlin in 1943. In other words, we would have had hundreds of more survivors if the Spanish had not interjected and alerted the Germans to say these are fake passports. Well, Am I right or wrong? Well, the, <laughs> you are a historian, I'm not. I, I know that there are various theories um, about what happened and why the Germans did not recognize the passports. Well, my belief is basically that um, there was still a distinction between Polish Jews and Dutch Jews. I mean, I shouldn't have said that because basically the, 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 the main idea about Holocaust is that every Jew was condemned, every Jew was not supposed to survive. But still, the treatment of Polish Jews was were harsher than, than, than treatment of Jews in France, in Holland, and so on. Because in Holland, the Germans at least tried to make, uh, make, it, make it resemble a certain legality. 
in, in Poland, they, they, just, they just shot. So Polish Jews saw death, and that was there. Everybody who survived in the ghetto knows that people, knew that people were being killed, not deported to the East. There was no deportation, there was just death. So they saw too much, and I believe that, and, but that's my personal belief that, uh, for example, the fact that the camp in Vitel in France where Polish Jews were interned was liquidated, and Bergen, Belgium was not, was dictated just by that. They were liquidated as unnecessary witnesses, as, as bandits do sometimes, because they had seen what, what, what happened in Poland. And, and I, 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 I've heard about, about the, the Spanish ambassador, of course, the Spanish denied it. Um, the, definitely Paraguay recognized the passports. Paraguay was asked by Poland in, the, in December 1943, and we had the, the documents immediately, re, Paraguay immediately reacted. Uh, recognizing the documents and contributing to the rescue of many people. But coming back to the numbers, when you see that the minority of Poles uh, uh, survived, we, and I would say that the operation was largely unsuccessful in Poland, but look what happened in the Netherlands and Germany. Most of Germans and, and Dutch, German and Dutch Jews who were in possession of Wadish passports survived the Holocaust in 61% of Jews, of Dutch Jews who were in possession of these passports survive. And so did 52% of German Jews. And the German, Austrian, and Dutch survivors outnumbered the Polish ones. Meaning, Alexander Wadosh acted completely beyond the duty. I don't consider, for example, rescuing Polish Jews by a Polish diplomat a certain heroism. It's a duty of a diplomat. And risking his life, yes, it's our duty. From time to time, we must put, put the risk. That's our profession. We risk for the country. So we, risk, we take a risk for, for our citizens. So Alexander Wadosh, until he rescued the Polish ones, he did his duty. But when he decided in 1943 that Yes, Polish Jews had been largely murdered, and it should be over. He decided to continue with the operation and to create the same fake documents for the Dutch and for the German ones. This passport was, was made for, the German, for, 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 for a German Jewish family, Liechtenstein, uh, who was at that time interned in Germany. Other, other groups uh, of people who had in possession who came from Czechoslovakia, Austria, Belgium, France, they were mostly leaders of Jewish resistance in, in these countries, like working group in Slovakia, like uh, uh, De Secours aux Enfants uh, in France, like, uh, like uh, De Lassem group in, in, in Italy. This is what we assume, uh, given that between 26% and 46% on the people on the list, it depends how we count, whether we count those whose fate is unknown or not survived. We estimate that given that eight to 10,000 people had this passport, so the rate of survival should be between 30 and 35%, which would give two to 3,000 uh, people one of these families, look, this is their, their kind of uh, uh, home reliquia. It, it, it's, it's, it's been found in, 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 in Israel. Well, uh, I mean, I, it's probably time to finish and to answer your questions. So as a moderator, uh, I want to give the, the public here, the audience time, uh, in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, if you have any questions or remarks uh, here to the panel, uh, please uh, make it make yourself known and uh, ask your questions or make your remarks about this uh, what you just heard now. Anyone? Uh, okay, the gentleman there at the far end. Yes, please. So I would be interested. Do we know why we choose? Do we know why just yeah. these four Latin American? Yeah. Why exactly those four Latin? I'm sure that uh, Ambassador uh, Kumar and uh, Mr. Danuta will agree with me because these consuls were ready to sell passports in return for money. So this is money. Uh, uh, they, they, they exacted payments uh, and uh, so they were available uh, and that's the reason why uh, we have so many passports from uh, these countries, especially from Paraguay. Paraguayan consul was the first one to sell passports. He started with selling visas to German Jews in 1939 after the annexation of Austria. 
visas. German Jews needed visas. They had passports, but their passports were marked with J, Jude, Jew. And many countries would refuse to give them visas. So this individual sold a few visas in 1939. Probably he was contacted, met by Polish diplomats, and they knew that he was ready to do such a business. And they started to do a business with him to rescue people, as you said, from the, from the Soviet Union, to let, let them travel further east and to be, to be rescued from the Soviet persecution. Later on, they extended this operation uh, to um, the Holocaust victims. But at the beginning, it was very limited, several dozens, hundreds, until the massive, scale, uh, massive phase of Holocaust began uh, after, after the Vansi conference when they understood that there's a big Jewish demand for, for these passports, but there are also rich, rich thieves who are trying to make profit out of it, they found Abraham Zilberschein to say, listen, unless you do, do it, we have a black market. So they managed to diminish the prices by, by, by offering a wholesale uh, agreement to the Paraguayan. And they also add, uh, gave the right to Zilberschein to find other providers. And he did it. P P Paraguay, Peru, and Honduran are not Polish fakes. Like pa these are real passports issued by real consuls and bought by Zilberschein directly. Yeah. Paraguay are Polish fakes. Just uh, there, we have a lady there in the back. Please stand up. What's your question? So uh, your question was about Sugihara and Mendes and the others. What happened to them? Okay, so what happened to them? They were, they were penalized by their governments, yes. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Uh, my understanding of this whole operation, uh, that uh, Wadosh went out on a, on a bind, uh, he did not ask first permission from the government in London whether he could do a thing like that. For this very simple reason, had he asked permission, I'm sure that he would have been told, maybe don't do it, not to that extent. Because imagine that the government of Paraguay in Honduras would have discovered that the Polish government is uh, telling Lados to issue false, uh, uh, to issue false Paraguayan passport. So uh, the government in London was aware of what uh, Lados was doing, uh, didn't tell him not to do, didn't tell him yes to do, but the others took it upon themselves, the responsibility. In case this whole thing would explode and be scandalous, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, uh, Wadosh would have suffered uh, the consequences. He would have been fired and the Polish government might have said, uh, uh, we were not aware uh, the extent of this thing. Uh, that's my uh, understanding uh, of uh, what happened here. So, he did not, he was not penalized because after all, the Polish government was proud that uh, one of its am ambassadors was involved in help to Jews. After all, the Polish government itself in London was a pure persecuted government, okay? So you cannot compare it to Sugihara vis-a-vis -vis his government in Japan was part of the Axis, or you cannot compare with Mendes France vis-a-vis uh, -vis Zalazar in Portugal, who was pro-fascist. Pro the Polish government in, in London was itself a persecuted government. But it had no power and nothing. Uh, it didn't have the control over its own territory. Okay, so uh, they were not going to penalize uh, uh, Wadosh, but Yadosh took it upon himself, everything that he did. So, uh, and the risk was not that he was going to be uh, penalized by his government, but by the Swiss authorities. That's my interpretation of that. You have a different interpretation? Uh, no, I have basically a very similar interpretation. Um, well, Polish government supported this operation. Uh, what I started is yes, on his own, because this is a nature of being uh, of, of, the, uh, of the ambassadorship. I mean, I'm ambassador. I, 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 it's, it's, it's obvious that we take decisions. This is our job. And uh, informing the government, of course, you can sometimes, if you are a coward, you, you will always try to obtain permission before you move your finger. You lift your, lift your finger. But uh, many ambassadors in such hard duress of the war would take the decision by themselves. 
This was but the, main, the, the, the objective was to rescue the lives of Polish citizens. Whether legally or illegally, it was not really important. Then Wadosh did not inform the government because he was responsible. And what, for example, if such a cable was intercepted, had been intercepted? And what, for example, if the Swiss caught him or, or caught him uh, uh, doing illegal things? He he would be expelled himself. The blame would be put on him, not on the government. He would probably spare the rescue the, 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 the embassy from being closed. It was a very responsible movement. Uh, after the war, after the war, even during the war, 1945, many Jewish organizations, and particularly Aguda Israel was quite active in uh, sending thank you letters to the Polish government mentioning Alexander Wadoś. And finally, there was a response on one of these letters. This is a document I have never published and have never, never shared. He, Chaim, not Chaim, it's Sternbuch probably who writes uh, that uh, without Wadosh, no, not many many people would not have been said, uh, and Wadoś and Kühl, and the response is, yeah, we are really thankful for your words, but all what this gentleman did was on our request, which is not entirely true, but 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 this the, the government admitted that yes this was a governmental opera operation and monica you have found actually a very important thing that all the cables referring to the passport operation have the same signature it's called the operation passport issues sprawy paszportowe so right yeah i told free <laughs> dot d yeah how, how was it how was it numbered 803. 803. 803 slash e passport operation. So the government managed this. And after the war, the communists took over the Poland. We, we sometimes forget this, this, this fact. And also which in Polish Jewish relations, po communists took over, communists governed Poland, pro Soviet communists, and these diplomats simply, simply they, they resigned. They, they lived a miserable life of political refugees in, in the 50s. Uh, so none, none of these three Polish diplomats returned to Poland no. after the war. They were anti-communist. But I want to mention something. I remember when I was at Yad Vashem and I was sitting in one of the commission se sessions, and the head of the commission was uh, Justice uh, Moshe Beisky, one of the Schindler Juden. And uh, he said that there are some stories that cry out to heaven. They may not meet all the exact criteria, but we simply cannot deny the title of righteous. And I have to mention, we have one of the great righteous Gentiles that we have on our list is Raoul Wallenberg. And Raoul Wallenberg did not disobey. He was sent by his government to rescue Jews. He was sent by the Swedish government. He was a diplomat, and his job was to save Jews. And we honor him as a righteous gent because of the scope of the operation. So that's why I am very confident that in this case also, uh, Wadosh and Rinievich will, will, will be recipients of the righteous title by Yad Vashem. I, I just want to thank the panel very much for your being with us this evening. And we hope that all of you will take this story with you and share it with others as a way of commemorating those who perished, those who survived, and those who uh, lived to tell the story. Thank you so much. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS. Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. 
Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.